Okay, so today we're going to talk about the history of dye. Um, this might be kind of long. I might end up chopping this into two lectures. We will see. So I wrote down notes so that I don't talk forever, hopefully. That's the goal. All right. So basically, all of you have had 2D design, right? I assume at this point, this is a higher level class, you've probably had 2D design uh, or foundations of design or something in that area. Um, and so you should be familiar with color theory, including color physics and chemistry, I would think. So I'm not going to go into the history of the theory of color here, because that's something that you should already know and have a pretty good idea about. Isaac Newton stabbing himself in the eye, coming up with the way colors separate from light, that kind of thing. Um, so we know that color is fundamental to our experience of the world around us. We know that in 1666, Isaac Newton began experimenting with uh, prisms and beams of light and discovered the physics of color. Okay. Perhaps you also know that Pliny the Elder, who is a uh, Roman who wrote in the first century AD about many things, also said that classical Greek painters used only four colors. So Pliny the Elder says that classical Greek painters use only black, white, red, and yellow which is a pretty limited palette. Or perhaps you know that the Egyptians developed a bright, clear blue pigment as early as 2500 BC out of ground up lapis lazuli, uh, or which is called uh, calcium copper silicate, um, and the blue comes from copper. So that added to the palette in the ancient world and added things like blue. This is all in pigments and painting though, so we're, we're not too dying yet. Um, the history of color and of paint is a different story, okay? So what we're talking about is not the history of color, it's not color theory, it's not color physics, and it's not really even the history of paint and pigment. Specifically, we're going to talk about the history of dye, which is a little bit of a different story. A dye is any colored substance that chemically bonds to the substrate to which it's being applied. So this distinguish, distinguishes dyes from pigments which do not chemically bind to the material they color. Okay, so that's why dyes are different than say paints. The dye is generally applied in an aqueous solution, meaning it's combined with water, and may require a mordant to improve the fastness of the dye on the fiber, meaning you might have to add something else like vinegar or ammonia or salt to make the dye stay. Fastness means that it stays, it becomes permanent. Okay, so here is an overview of the chronological history of dyes in general. Then we're gonna take a closer look at the history of specific dyes that were um, historically significant. So I'm just gonna run through this slide really quickly. The earliest pigment that we know of is from the lower Paleolithic period, which is 350,000 years ago. So humans have been using dye for over 350,000 years. That's pretty crazy. That's pretty substantial, right? Some evidence shows that textile dyeing dates back as early as the Neolithic period or the New Stone Age, which was 10,200 years, uh, 10,200 BCE. Dyed flax fibers have been found in prehistoric caves in the Republic of Georgia from before 36,000 uh, BP. In India and Phoenicia, dyeing has been happening for over 5,000 years. Forms of resist dyeing have been performed throughout Asia for thousands of years. Resist dyeing is where you put down um, wax or some kind of substance to block dye from, um, from transmitting throughout a fabric so you can create patterns that way. Um, some data suggests that dyeing was done more than 4,000 years ago because of the evidence of dyed fabrics found in Egyptian tombs. Lots of mummies have dyed fabrics on them. Um, during 7200 to 2000 BC, the period when fixed settlements and textiles were being developed, dyes were also used pretty abundantly. We have lots of evidence of that. We have um, remaining barrels and pots of dye stuff as well as dyed cloth fragments and written uh, records. In medieval times, dye guilds developed, which is what we have an illustration of here, and they developed their dye stuffs and methods under strict, strict secrecy, okay? So people were very competitive and some people were even murdered. They were killed, tortured and killed to get their knowledge of dye. So it became pretty crazy. 
And then we jump forward. The first synthetic dye was uh, the color mauve, and it was discovered by William Henry Perkin in 1856. And that put an end to a lot of the competitiveness of dyeing and the secrecy. Okay. Um, so we definitely have a significant amount of evidence about dyes in the Neolithic age, which literally means new stone age, lith meaning stone, neo meaning new, um, which was 10,200 BC-ish, okay? So dyes in this time were derived from sources found in nature like vegetables, like plants, like trees, lichens, insects, um, and dependence on natural dyes lasted until the 1850s when synthetic dyes were created. So all of the dyes we're about to look at are naturally occurring forms of dye, okay? Um, throughout history, people have dyed their textiles using common and then locally available materials, materials they could find in their immediate area. Um, and this is true in our class too, right? My other dye lecture where I tell you all the stuff that you could find in your kitchen or yard that you can dye with. So similar kind of mentality. Um, the more rare materials that made good dye bases and produced more um, intense and more permanent, more color fast kind of colors were very valuable and were considered luxury items in the ancient and medieval worlds. And they became a big part of trade and became a big aspect of um, colonialism and conquering other areas. Um, before we get into the specific history of dyes, it's important to note that dye is not a uniform catch-all, okay? There were and still are many different kinds of dyes, and here's a categorical list. We're not going to delve into all the differences between these types of dyes, but I just want you to know that when we talk about dye, there's a whole bunch of things. Acid dye, direct dye, substantive dyes, mordant dyes, fat dyes, reactive dyes, dispersed dyes, azoic dyes, sulfur dyes, and resist dyeing all exist in the world. So there's a lot of, this is a big field that I'm kind of just generally going into. Okay, so within the various types of dyes, there are a significant number of dye bases. Um, as you know, again, from, from the lecture on dyeing at home and, and with household items that, that you've already watched of mine, there are a great number of dye bases that are readily available today, and this was true in the ancient world as well. This is a list of dyes that have been historically significant. We'll take a closer look at most of these, not quite all of them because there's some that have a lot of overlap, <coughs> but we'll take a peek at most of these pretty closely. Um, so most of these, we're going to start with um, plant-based dyes and then and, and ones that you're more likely to have heard of, and then we're going to move on to dyes that come from animals. Okay? All right. So first off, let's look at henna. I would venture a guess that most of you have heard of henna. Um, in Hindi and Urdu, the art of henna is called Mahindi, um, and it's been practiced for over 5,000 years. Um, in Pakistan, India, Africa, and the Middle East, this is a long, uh, thousands of years old practice. Uh, the use of henna as a dye is older and has been documented as far back as 9,000 years. So when I talk about the practice of henna, I'm talking about like in this illustration where the, the hands are decorated, the skin is decorated with henna. That's generally what we think of when we hear henna today. And that practice has existed for over 5,000 years. Using henna, uh, the plant, as a dye for cloth has actually existed um, perhaps longer, or it could have been being used on skin 9,000 years ago too, and we just didn't know it and didn't have evidence of it. Um, so henna has natural cooling properties. Um, chemically speaking, it has a reaction that causes natural cooling. So perhaps it was first used by people in desert climates um, who made a paste out of the henna leaves. So henna is a plant, so you pick the leaves and then you crush it into a powder, mix it with water and make a paste. And then they packed it onto their skin and this was done to keep cool. Um, when they did this, they realized that it left a stain behind, that it was dyeing their skin. And because they figured, they, they noticed this, they figured it could also be used um, purposefully decoratively on the skin, but also used to dye other things like cloth. So it's becomes refined for dyeing textiles and for 
creating these intricate kind of patterns on the skin that are what we generally think of when we think of henna today. Um, ancient Egyptian mummies have been discovered to have henna designs on their preserved skin. So we know that um, this was a practice that was done in Northern Africa as well. Um, Cleopatra is documented as having used henna. She used it, um, we think, cosmetically um, for eyeliner purposes. Uh, and also perhaps um, some of the mummies, they dyed their fingernails and toenails dark with henna. Um, henna is uh, called Losonia inermis, is the Latin word for the plant, and it's also known as Mignonwet, uh, the Mignonwet tree, or the Egyptian privet, are the, the different names the, the plant has. Um, it's a flowering plant, it grows 12 to 15 feet high, so it's kind of a bushy tree. Um, the English word henna actually comes from the Arabic alhinia, and this is also what the dye is called, as we know. It is used not only um, on skin, but it's also used on hair and fingernails. And it's also traditionally been used to dye silk, wool, and leather. So as a dye, and this shouldn't be too much of a surprise since if you think about our skin and our hair, these are protein based. So as a dye, it also works better on protein fiber. So it works well on silk and uh, wool and also to dye leather. Um, there's evidence that the use of henna as dye originates in the Neolithic settlements at Katal Hiuk and that it was part of a ritual for their fertility goddess. So it also has some um, religious and, and ritualistic background. Uh, we know that it was also used by the Babylonians, the Assyrians, the Sumerians, the Semites, the uh, Ugaritics, and the Canaanites. And the earliest written record of its use is from the legend of Baal, of the Ergoratic people. So in this le legend, it's written on a tablet from 2100 BC that was found in present day Syria. So there's a discussion of the process of using henna as a dye in this legend. Henna was also used extensively in ancient southern China, um, mostly for dyeing leather. In the 4th and 5th centuries, henna use um, in the Deccan of western India is illustrated on bodhisattvas and deities in cave paintings in uh, Ajanta and in Sri Lanka. So it also has a history associated with religious practices um, in India as well. So that is henna, that's our first dye we're going to look at. The next one you've probably also heard of, um, if not the dye itself, perhaps you've heard of the band the Indigo Girls. Um, so indigo is also a plant-based dye, and um, it's from a variety, it comes from a variety of different plants. Their indigo as a substance exists in, a, in different kinds of plants, it's not just one plant. Um, so a variety of plants have been the source of indigo throughout history, but most natural indigo is from um, plants of the genus Indigofera, which yeah. are found in the tropics, particularly in India. We associate the history of this dye definitely with India. Um, dyer's knotweed, Polygona tincturum, uh, was the most important blue dye in East Asia prior to the discovery of, of indigo and is sometimes also referenced as indigo. Indigo works best on um, plant fibers like cotton. It's what makes blue jeans blue. That's probably what it's most known for today. It can also be used on protein fibers, so it can be used on silk and wool just as well, but it works better on cotton than a lot of the dyes that we're going to talk about today. Indigo is one of the oldest dyes used for textiles. The oldest known fabric dyed with indigo is 6,000 years old, and it was discovered in Huaca Preta uh, in Peru. So it, this is a dye that was also used in the Americas, not just in Asia and not just in Europe. So it's fairly far reaching. Part of that is because there are different kinds of plants in the indigo family that live in different areas and all yield the same kind of dye stuff. Um, indigo is used in ancient civilizations in India, Japan, Mesopotamia, Egypt, Britain, Mesoamerica, Peru, Iran, and parts of Africa. Indigo is cultivated in India 
which is the earliest center for its mass production. So the reason it's mostly associated with India is because that is the first area to really see it as um, kind of a cash commodity and really cultivate and mass produce it and export it. Uh, the Greeks and the Romans valued it as a luxury product because blue was an unusual color for, for the ancient world. Uh, there's a Neo-Babylonian cuneiform tablet from the 7th century BC that details a recipe for dyeing, um, and the, the recipe calls it a lapis-colored wool. The word for that is ugnatu in, um, uh, in cuneiform, and it talks about dyeing this with indigo, which was probably imported from India to Babylonia at this time. In 1882, this tablet was acquired by the British Museum in London, and it took them 11 decades. It took them 110 years to understand it and figure it out. So it's only 2.75 inches cubed, so it's not a very big tablet. <coughs> it was written in Babylon between 600 and 500 BC. In the 1990s, when academics finally solved the translation of this thing, they were kind of... Um, well, some of them were pretty thrilled to figure out that it was this old dyeing recipe, and some of them were really like mystified that this was something um, considered important enough to, to inscribe in a tablet and preserve for all this time. And so it's it just shows the importance of this practice and of dye stuff to ancient civilization. For a long time, it was presumed that the seeds for indigo producing plants and the knowledge for how to use them had been transmitted west along trade routes from India to the Middle East and to Africa. Um, an etymological root in the Greek root of indigo, which is indicon, which means a substance from India. So its name literally comes from um, describing it geographically as being something that comes from India. But it's now thought that various people discovered the dyeing process independently across the world, and that was kind of simultaneously collective consciousness, like discovered in different places at the same time. But the name we know it by today, indigo, does come from the Greek word meaning substance from India. So that's kind of interesting. Um, as I said earlier, there are different species of plants that produce indigo, and one of them is woad which we will talk about later in this lecture. That's W-O-A-D. Indigo, unlike most dyes, does not need a mordant to fix the fabric, so it can be fast and fixed all by itself. Indigo thread is woven into the uh, burial customs of many different cultures globally, from Peru to Indonesia, from Mali to Pakistan. Ancient Egyptian dyers wove it into the linen mummy cloth starting around 2400 BC. Um, men in the Tuareg tribe in northern Africa are given uh, tanglemots, which are headscarves. Um, the, they're given to them at a special ceremony that marks the transition into manhood. And an indigo tanglemots is a prestigious distinction. So it has a lot of different cultural, cultural associations throughout the world, but all of them are, are part of important ceremonies. Because it has always been valuable and culturally, culturally significant in many cultures, indigo has been a bedrock of global trade. Um, many of you remember from middle school social studies and history, um, maybe your teachers talking about um, spices being one of the things that was heavily traded and, and when um, Europeans went forward and conquered and colonized and brutalized all the people all around the world, one of the things that they were after and one of the things that they were interested in developing quicker trade routes for were spices. And we talk about spices and gold a lot when we talk about um, that history. One of the other things that was very sought after and actually in some cases like cochineal, which we'll talk about a little later, was a more valuable commodity and a more valuable export that became part of um, the European economy were dye stuff. So dye stuffs, dye bases, became a really important part of trade and a really important part of the European uh, economy. In Rome, for example, indigo was imported at 20 denarii a pound, which is about 15 times the average daily wage of, of people. Merchants tried selling counterfeited indigo made out of pigeon dung, which um, was 
uh, against the law, and the merchants could be um, beaten, thrown in jail, fined, or even killed. So it's a pretty big deal in Rome. Um, another word for indigo in the ancient world was nil, N-I-L. Uh, in the New World, the Spanish began producing indigo on a commercial scale in Guatemala in 1524. New trade routes and the heavy um, exploitation of slave labor drove down the price of indigo. Um, once it was more affordable, again, because of colonization and because of exploiting illegal, like, horrible human enslavement and in, in human labor, um, this drives the price down, it makes it more affordable, and it becomes kind of a standard dye for things like military uniforms. So it isn't quite as precious and prestigious after this time. Um, for example, Napoleon's uh, Grand Army used 150 tons of indigo per year just for dyeing their uniforms. William Perkin, who we'll mention a lot today, um, discovers a way to synthesize dyes, to make synthetic dyes, in 1856. Thirty years later, the German chemist Adolf von Bayer develops what he calls pure indigo, which is a synthetic version of indigo. After this development, indigo became associated with um, labor, and this is actually where we get the phrase blue collar. So when you talk about blue collar workers or the labor class being blue collar, that's actually from um, indigo. Once indigo was made synthetic and cost effective and was no longer considered this precious thing, um, it's something that the workforce in Europe, Japan, and China use. So from the dusty blue Mao suits in China to the American blue jeans and uh, blue jean overalls, this is its most enduring legacy, is this connection to um, labor and, and, and to affordability and kind of this um, much more accessible place than, than where it started as this very prestigious and, and luxurious, expensive thing. Okay, next we're going to talk about saffron. Saffron is a spice and a dye, and it is derived from the flower of Crocus sativus, or saffron crocus. It is the world's most costly spice by weight. The um, etymology of saffron is thought to be the 12th century, um, kind of in the old French before the French language um, transitioned and changed quite a bit. It was what we called Old French, and the term was saffron. And uh, that comes from the Latin saffronum, which is linked to the Arabic zafaron, which originates from the Persian zarparan, which means gold strung or gold string or strung with gold. So the origin of the word saffron has connotation to how expensive and valuable it is and was. Um, saffron has been traded and used for thousands of years. Um, some 50,000 year old cave paintings in Iraq were found to have traces of saffron in the pigment used to paint the cave walls. The ancient Greeks used it to dye clothes. On the island of Thera, there is a perfectly preserved fresco painting of women gathering saffron um, from the crocuses. Um, we know it was traded across the Red Sea from Egypt to Southern Arabia during the first century AD. It's also been grown in England and was highly cultivated in England. Um, and that cultivation of that crop, according to legend, started when a single bulb of saffron crocus was hidden in the brim of uh, a guy's hat and was brought uh, during the reign of Edward III, which is 1315-ish, 1312-ish, to like 1375-77-ish. So during that time period, um, that kicked off Britain's tenure as a saffron-producing powerhouse. So there was it, it works pretty well in the British climate, so there um, was quite a bit of cultivation during that time period. In 2013, one ounce of saffron costs $364. It takes between 31,800 and 45,500 flowers to produce one pound of the spice, to give you an idea of how incredibly expensive and rare this commodity is. 
it's been um, used possibly as a dye longer than it's been used for food, but it's kind of hard to tell because it has this history where it's been used in both contexts for many, 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 many years. Um, it has a very singular taste. It's kind of a hard taste to describe. I don't know if you've ever had anything with saffron. It has kind of a, um, it's kind of pungent and then slightly sweet. It's, it's sort of a, I don't know, it's kind of an umami but a little bit sweet kind of, of flavor. It sort of reminds me a little bit of like mushroom but with a little caramelized kind of taste at the end um, and a little bit tangy, a little bit strange. It's very unusual. It's a very singular kind of spice. In 1374, uh, the hijacking of 800 pounds of saffron resulted in the 14-month Saffron War, which started in Basel, uh, Switzerland in 1444. Um, in uh, Nuremberg in Germany, a man was burned alive for the crime of using marigold to fake saffron at market. So this is another dye stuff that was taken very, very seriously. Um, it produces a dye that ranges from yellow to a very bright orange, as you can see in the image here. Um, it is famously used to dye Buddhist robes, so those orange robes um, that we affiliate with Buddhist monks are dyed with saffron. Alexander the Great used it to make his hair look gold. He added it to his hair to make it have kind of a golden sheen. Uh, Zoroastrian priests used it to make golden ink and they used this golden ink um, which was supposed to ward off evil. So they would use it to write different passages and things to um, ward off evil and they used it um, when they were writing out their their prayers for ceremony. So it also has some real religious um, history and connotation. Okay, Brazil wood. Brazil wood is uh, Pombrasilia echinata and it's a flowering plant. It's actually, um, it's a tree but it's in the legume family which is sort of strange. Um, the, that family uh, branch is the Fabaceae. It is a Brazilian timber tree, and it's known um, as perm umbunco wood or Brazil wood. Um, it's the national tree of Brazil. It has dense orange red uh, heartwood, the heartwood being the interior part of the wood, so you, you can't really extract it like from the bark. You have to cut into the heartwood of the tree. And the wood is used for um, bows, like bow and arrows, and it's also used um, to produce stringed instruments. So if you have like a Brazil wood guitar or a Brazil wood violin, that's a very sought after kind of wood for instruments as well. Um, in addition to yielding the red dye known as Brazilin. The country Brazil is actually named after the tree, which is kind of an interesting um, little trivia bit for you. It was called Terra de Brasil meaning the land of Brazil wood. So the reason we know Brazil as Brazil is because of its very valuable Brazil wood trees. Starting in the 16th century, Brazil wood became very valuable in Europe. Um, its Asian relative sapon wood uh, was used in powdered form as a dye for many years before uh, Brazil wood was um, cultivated for dye stuff. Um, it was Blah, 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 blah. It was particularly used to dye uh, velvet red and was in high demand in the Renaissance. So this is one of the things that the Venetian red velvets that we um, maybe associate with the Renaissance and, and with the late medieval periods. Brazil wood is one of the things that was used to dye that. Uh, when the Portuguese colonized and invaded what is now Brazil in 1500, they saw that the tree was abundant there and so it became a major trade sta uh, staple at this time and lots and lots of trees were cut down and harvested and shipped back to Europe to be turned into dye stuff. Okay, uh, carotenoids are lipid soluble yellow orange red dyes and they're found in a lot of higher plants, even plants that don't have an orangish color, a lot of them have this component. Um, plant algae, fungal and synthetic Carotenoids are used in dyeing, particularly as natural food dyes. Um, the name derives from the carrot, and you see reference to, to using orange um, 
fungus and using orange um, mushrooms and different orange plants in some medieval transcripts talking about dyeing, they tend to be used, they work better in food dye than in cloth dye. They tend not to, to be fast. They tend not to stay very well. But I want to throw this in here because this was something that is talked about historically as a dye stuff. Um, weld is, uh, the Latin name is Reseda lutola, and it's also known as dyer's weed. So it was named for what it was used for, which was to dye things. So if you see something that says dyer's weed, it is talking about weld. Um, it is native to Eurasia. It grows in a variety of climates. It produces a rich yellow, which can be mixed with woad, which we haven't talked about yet, but we will. Um, it can be mixed with woad to create um, a classic green, some classic green pigments such as Lincoln green, which in the textile industry is kind of a standby color that's used a lot. Um, it has, it was first used in the first millennium BC. It works equally well on plant or protein fibers. You can dye pretty much anything with it. Um, and it fell out of fashion for dye use in the beginning of the 20th century when cheaper synthetics were developed, but a lot of yellow, particularly in Europe, um, up until the 20th century was dyed using weld. It doesn't have as rich of a history in terms of um, its influence because it was so readily available. Okay, matter. Matter is also called uh, rubia, and it's in the family Rubaceae. Um, there are 80 different species of matter. So matter is, um, when you say matter, it can mean a great variety of plants. Uh, cloth dyed with matter has been found on Egyptian mum mummies again. So our mummies have another color pop up uh, in, their, in their mummy wardrobe. It was widely cultivated in Europe, Asia, and Africa as a red dye source. In Herodotus' time, um, Libyan women used it to dye their cloaks, so that's the first written record of it. Its roots contain alizarin, which um, gives it its red color. Um, it's called rose matter sometimes when it's used as a dye, and matter lake when it's used as a paint. The flowers of the plant are small and kind of a greenish yellow, but they're not they don't produce dye, they're not used for dyeing. Um, the fleshy reddish roots, which I have a picture of here, are the part that's actually the dye source of the plant. So you have to dig the plant's roots up to produce it, which makes it sort of expensive to cultivate. Um, our friend William Henry Perkin, who discovers mauve and basically invented synthetic dye, also uh, was able to synthesize alizarin, which is the uh, red that comes from matter. So that was one of the earliest things that he um, was able to make a synthetic version of. Pliny the Elder wrote about matter's importance in the classical world. And although it was one of the most popular dyes in Europe, it had some, some serious drawbacks. So there were some problems with it. Um, it had been used in, it, uh, blah, blah, it had been used in Egypt um, and in India as well. And it was the source of the red worn by Greek and Roman warriors. So if you've seen old illustrations of Greek and Roman soldiers who are wearing red as either a sash or a cloak or in some part of their wardrobe, that was most likely dyed with matter. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. It's very sensitive to temperature and uh, alkalinity. So it's, it's kind of unstable. Sometimes um, you get red when you use it, sometimes you get pink, sometimes you get orange. So it's kind of hard to control, it's kind of unpredictable, and it's kind of hard to make stay the color that you want it to stay. So it was um, abundant and easy to grow, but the using it, like the application of it was the tricky part. However, the dyers of the Ottoman Empire and in India knew how to get a consistent and rich red from matter. They kind of perfected the use of it. And the Europeans called it Turkey red because of this, because the Ottomans come from the region that's Turkey. Um, it worked best on cotton, which was kind of rare in Renaissance Europe. Most things tended to work better on wool. Um, and cotton wasn't used a lot in uh, Europe in the Renaissance. Um, the intricate process involved a dozen different steps, and it took around four months. 
Um, and it, it involved mixing ox blood and castor oil and dung together with the dye stuff to get it to work, so it was kind of yucky. Um, the use of mordants made matter more color fast. This information spread um, around Europe and it, it made use of matter more popular. Um, India's chintz fabrics were printed with it. Medieval wedding clothes in Europe used matter. It was used for the British redcoats um, as a cheaper alternative to cochineal, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Brazil wood was more reliable for getting deep crimson and became a popular matter alternative for the fancier uppercut of European clientele. So because this was kind of unpredictable it was and abundant in Europe, it was cheaper, but it didn't make the kind of quality of reds as some of the other dyes. Okay, woad. Woad is uh, Asatis tinctoria. It's also call, called dyer's woad or glastum. Um, it's also sometimes called the asp of Jerusalem, though not really anymore and not super commonly. Um, it's native to the Caucasus steppes um, and Central Asia and Eastern Siberia, but it's now found throughout Europe and Western North America. So it was kind of spread around once it was discovered that it was useful for dyeing things. Um, the first archaeological finds of woad date back to the Neolithic period. It's one of the earliest natural dyes that was used with consistency in Europe. They've been found in pottery, um, like actual the dye stuff in powder form has been found in pottery, um, in storage, in many ancient people's, um, many archaeological sites in Europe. Celtic blue is a shade of woad, and it's known as uh, glass Celtic in Welsh, or Gorum Celtiac in both the Irish language and the Scottish Gaelic. Julius Caesar wrote that the Britanni used to color their bodies blue with vitrum. Vitrum in Latin means glass, but um, basically the domestic name for woad um, was also vitrum because um, basically it, it kind of looked, it, it looked like glass, like the word means water-like. So the fact that it's blue and the fact that glass is kind of like has properties of water. Um, so woad was kind of referred to with the same kind of um, phrasing and words as glass. So it's a little bit confusing in some historical context. So uh, woad produces a variety of greens and blues. Um, it's not super consistent. It's not as consistent as indigo. Indigo, you pretty much always know that you're going to get blue. Woad is kind of unpredictable. It's similar to matter in that way. Um, technically, it's one of 30 or so species of plants that can produce indigo, but the, um, the extraction process to get pure indigo is quite difficult. Once it's picked, the leaves are then ground into a paste. Uh, they're then rolled into balls, like you can see in the illustration here, um, and then they're left to cure. They have to cure for about 10 weeks, and after that amount of time, three quarters of their size is lost because they're curing, they're kind of drying out. Um, water is then added back to them, and they're left to ferment again for two more weeks. Um, this kind of has like a thick tar-like consistency. Then it's fermented one more time, um, with wood ash and then it can be used as dye stuff for cloth. So it's a very long process to turn it into a dye base. The Vikings also used woad. Some say the word Britain derives from the Celtic meaning painted people. So it's kind of important um, just in terms of the etymology of uh, the, the geography of Europe. Um, along with matter, which was red and weld, which was yellow, Woad was one of the three staple dyes of the medieval world, and as you know from color theory, that means we have blue woad, we have red matter, and we have yellow weld, which are primary colors. So from that, all different colors could be made by mixing them. Um, unlike red or purple, blue could be worn by anyone. Um, there were some very particular rules about who was allowed to wear certain colors, particularly certain reds and certain purples in uh, the ancient world. 
Um, so since blue could be worn by anyone, it was really popular. So a lot of the just normal people wanted to wear woad blue. Um, it's also used as an under dye or an over dye to help deepen colors. So if you wanted to make a richer red with matter and it didn't turn as dark as you want, you could add a layer of woad that would mix in with it and deepen the color. From around 1230, woad was grown like matter um, near in, in large quantities. It was highly cultivated to be um, produced and to produce lots and lots of dye stuff in Europe. Uh, this created fierce rivalries, though, between woad producers and matter merchants. So, um, in Germany, in Magdeburg, which is the center of kind of the matter production and matter dye stuff trade, um, religious frescoes began to depict hell as being blue. Um, and in uh, Syringa, the matter merchants persuaded the stained glass artists to make the devils blue instead of red or black, which were the traditional colors. And this was in an effort to kind of make blue a bad color, to make blue associated with hell and the devil, because they thought that would dis decrease the popularity of woad, because they were afraid the popularity of woad would threaten their um, matter trade and their matter production. So it's kind of funny. Uh, woad becomes very popular despite these efforts. The, the effort to make um, blue devils and blue hell did not dissuade people. They were excited to have a new color that they could wear and afford to wear. In 1577, other indigo dyes from the East were allowed into the textile dyeing markets in London. <coughs> Excuse me. This kind of marked the beginning of the end for woad merchants because uh, indigo tended to work better. So they didn't go down without a fight. Ferdinand III of Germany declared indigo to be the devil's color in 1654. French dyers were not allowed to touch foreign indigo um, upon penalty of death. So again, very serious life or death things with dye stuff. But eventually indigo took over despite these drastic measures. And so woad kind of becomes less popular and is kind of edged out of the market by indigo. Logwood. Logwood dye was introduced into Europe by the late 1500s um, in the form of logs, hence the common name logwood. Um, it produces kind of violets and uh, grays and black. It's traditionally associated with the production of black dyes. Um, it's among the only natural dyes that are still used today. It comes from the heartwood, which is that interior part of the trunk um, of the uh, Hematstoxylon campichanium, it's a very difficult word to say. Uh, it is red, but it provides black, gray, and violet color. So it looks, as you can see from the sample of the wood up there, it looks very red, but it produces these dark, not red colors. It's native to southern Mexico, the Caribbean, and northern Central America. Um, it's a big trade item in the 17th and 18th and up through the 19th centuries, and other than synthetic dyes that produce black, it is one of the most reliable black dyeing agents. Okay, archyle, which is also called orchyl, it kind of depends on who's translating it. Um, it's also sometimes called orcine, uh, O-R-C-E-I-N. Um, these are dyes extracted from lichen. Um, they're sometimes called orchella weeds. And it's converted into orchin, which is what we kind of call the, the stuff that we make the dye from, for dyeing. Um, and it's, it's converted by using ammonia. And thus, traditionally, uh, the dye methods to produce it use urine. So it's kind of yucky. They use urine because it has high ammonia to help convert the lichen into dye stuff. It produces pinks, violets, reds, and browns. Um, lichen is kind of an interesting thing because it isn't just a single organism. Um, it's usually at least two different kinds of um, organisms together, usually a fungus and an alga or uh, algae and fungi together. Um, and they live in a symbiotic relationship, so they're entangled. It takes, um, it takes a microscope to like tell where they are. So we kind of read it as one organism, but it's actually two things. Um, the secret to archival production seems to have been um, just 
seem, uh, blah, 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 excuse me, the secret to archival production seems to have been lost uh, to the West until the 14th century, so people didn't really know how to use it. Um, an Italian merchant named Federico traveled to Levant. Levant is what is now like um, Israel, Palestine, Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, that region was all called Levant uh, in ancient times. And he was introduced to the tinting properties of lichen when he was there. So Federico brings back to Florence uh, this knowledge and then he seeks out these lichen and is able to figure out how to produce a rich purple color from them. His family changes their name to Richelis and they become extremely wealthy because they found this way to produce purple, which is a very sought after and unusual color. Um, knowledge of this dye then spreads. Lichen populations were fragile and were quickly exhausted. So um, it was also very labor intensive. It was very costly. They had to be harvested by hand. Um, they were then ground into powder and had to be combined with ammonia. Again, human urine, human pee again combined with it. A Venetian recipe from 1540 calls for 100 pounds of archival powder. So that's a ton of lichen, right? Because lichen is very light. Um, so 100 pounds of archival powder, 10 pounds of an alum mixed well until it is the consistency of dough. Then it had to be kneaded three times a day for up to 70 days before it could be used. So that's a lot of uh, labor to produce this particular dye. Lac. Okay, lac is still used today for things like shellac and lacquer. They both um, are produced from the same kind of substance. Lac is a, a resinous secretion of a number of species of lac insects, of which the most commonly cultivated is the Kyria lacca. Um, the bugs secrete the resin. It's then harvested as stick lac, which is what I have a picture of in the lower corner here. So that's the resin secreted by the bugs stuck on the stick of the, the tree or bush. Um, it's then crushed and then it has to be put through a, a sieve to, to get the wood out of it so that it's just the um, resin. Um, so you have to sift out all the impurities. The result is called seed lac. It's called this because it sort of looks like seeds. It's like little balls of resin. The word lac comes from the Sanskrit word laksha, which represents the number 100,000. It was used for this insect because the huge numbers would infest trees and just make resin all over the trees. So it's like, basically the word comes from the word for swarm, for like a swarm of insects. In ancient India, it was used to dye silk and wool. The use of it as a dye goes back to ancient times. Um, in China, it was used to dye leather goods. It's been replaced by synthetic dyes, but it's still produced for shellac and lacquer today. Okay, we're in the home stretch, I promise. Um, cochineal is a big one. So I'm going to try to limit how much I talk about this. This is part of why I'm reading from notes instead of just talking off my head so that I don't talk and talk and talk and talk. But I just finished reading a book that is about cochineal. So the book is called A Perfect Red by Amy Butler Greenfield. I highly recommend it. It's super fascinating, really good, uh, really good book. Uh, cochineal is a new world dye, as all our white people, Eurocentric uh, histories like to say, but it's the new world isn't really that new, it's just new to the European perspective. Um, it's been used as a dye in Central and South America since at least the second century BC and probably longer. We just don't have a written history older than that. It was intrinsic to the Aztec and the Incan empires. Um, it was part of the tributes that were paid to the rulers. So um, in uh, the Aztec and Incan empires, just like in the feudal empires um, and kingdoms in Europe, all of the surrounding villages and regions had to pay tribute to their ruler, to their emperor or their king. And one of the things that they had to pay was cochineal. So they had to produce a certain amount of cochineal and cochineal dyed cloth to pay as tribute. So it was literally like part of the um, economic system of these empires. Um, 
Da, 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 da. The color it produced was also used to signify power in the region. So if you were wearing all cochineal, all this very vibrant red, you were a big deal. You were someone very important. It's a dye derived from the cochineal insect, which is a cousin of the Kerms insect, which is something that was used in Europe to produce dye, which we're going to look at a variety of that next. Um, they both belong to the scale family, so scale bugs. Um, scales are a big problem for gardeners. If you're into gardening, you probably know what scales are because they have voracious appetites and like to wipe out different kinds of plants. Cochineal, which are of the genus um, Dactylopius, are very small. They're about a third the size of a ladybug. So picture a ladybug, picture a third of a ladybug. So that's how they naturally are in the wild. They've been cultivated now for thousands of years, and because they've been cultivated and have been crossbred to produce um, better, uh, a better crop of bugs, essentially, they now grow about um, twice the size that they used to. So two thirds of a ladybug now. Um, many species of scale will eat basically anything, but the cochineal are very persnickety, very particular creatures. Um, they only eat the round, spiny branches of prickly pear, which is a kind of cacti. Um, this kind of cacti is also called nopals, N-O-P-A-L-S. Um, as nymphs, so after they hatch from their eggs, they're in a larval phase called nymphs. Um, cochineal use their proboscis, which is their big long nose thing, kind of like a butterfly has, and they use that to suck the juices out of the cactus. So they kind of like, they're like cactus vampires, sort of. Um, female cochineal stay latched to their cacti for their whole life. They don't have wings. They make nests out of this white waxy stuff that kind of looks like tufts of cotton. So if you've ever seen a prickly pear, if you've been in the southwest or something, and on prickly pear cacti, there's this kind of wispy, cottony looking stuff. I always thought that was just part of the cactus. It's not part of the cactus. That is the nest of a cochineal. So they produce that waxy stuff and that's what they lay their eggs in. So there you go. Now that's in your brain and you're welcome. Um, okay, so the male cochineal do have wings. Um, there are far fewer of them born than females, but they have wings and they like go around and find mates and you know propagate the species with all the females who are stuck latched to their cacti and their weird nest things. Um, female cochineal produce carminic acid. They produce this as a defense mechanism because they don't have wings so they can't run away from predators. Um, but this carminic acid is what has the dye. So the carminic acid is, is what um, is the source of this super vibrant red dye. The oldest examples of cochineal dye, dyed cloth are in Peru. We don't know if it, that means that it was first, the process of dyeing with them was first discovered in Peru and then it moved up towards Mexico to where the Aztec people discovered it. Um, but the oldest found examples are, in, are from ancient Peru. Uh, the insects are harvested, then they're put on mats to dry for three to four days. Some farmers also um, put them in ovens to speed up the drying process so it dries them out quicker. Uh, they shrivel up and lose a third of their weight when they are dried, so they're already small and they get really small. It takes 70,000 dried cochineal insects to make one pound of dye. That is kind of a crazy amount. The Aztecs called them uh, nachestli, which literally means blood of the cactus, blood of the nopal ca cactus. In 1519, the conquistadors arrive in Mexico from Spain. They were very impressed by this cochineal dye. It makes consistently a much deeper, brighter, better red than madder, which is what's being used for red in uh, Europe, where they come from. The Spanish called the dye stuff grana. Um, Cortez was one of the important colonizers who came in and um, killed lots of people and tortured lots of people and took over Mexico. Um, he sent the initial shipments of cochineal to Europe to his king, Charles, who was very, very impressed uh, with this dye stuff. Most of the cochineal that arrived in Europe was used to dye textiles, but some of it was also used for cosmetics. So it spreads throughout Europe. Spain sells it to everybody. Um, and if you've seen images of like 
Queen Elizabeth I, Elizabethan Europe, where they had the super, super, super white powdered faces and then the really, really bright red lips and the bright red cheeks, that's cochineal. They used cochineal to, to produce that effect in Britain and, and in other parts of Europe, but I mostly associate that kind of look with uh, Britain. Um, cochineal was also used um, in paints uh, by artists. The pigment Crimson Lake is made from cochineal and it was used and, and written about and praised by Tintoretto, Vermeer, Rembrandt, Rubens, Jean van Eyck. Uh, they all used cochineal pigments. And then later, um, Canaletto, Gainsborough, Seurat, and JMW Turner also all used cochineal. Velasquez in Spain used cochineal. So it was a very popular, not just as a dye for cloth, but also to be used in pigments for artists, for painters. Um, Europeans also believed that cochineal had medicinal properties and it was prescribed for a lot of different ailments. It was given, you were supposed to ingest it um, in powder form, like dissolved in a liquid for everything from jaundice to syphilis. Um, King Philip III of Spain, anytime he felt bad, he would sit in his bathtub and have his servants pour cochineal mixed with vinegar over him. I guess because it made, it dyed you a little bit, it made you like rosy or complected, they thought it was good for you. It doesn't actually have any good medicinal properties, but in Europe they thought that it was good for all kinds of things. Um, it was also used to dye food, so it was also used to dye food to make food look more appealing and brighter in color. Um, the plunder of the New World resources through violent means to pay old world debts is a common story. It's the story of um, colonialism um, and all the evil things that were done by white Europeans to various people in all parts of the world. So this is definitely part of the cochineal history as well. Cochineal was the most valuable export from the Spanish New World colonies after silver. So in the 1560s, as many as 175,000 pounds of cochineal dye stuff were harvested annually, um, resulting in around 250,000 pesos a year. Um, Philip III of Spain taxed the dye stuff in Mexico, so he taxed the people who were producing it for them to be able to use what they were producing. They had to pay a really heavy tax. Then he taxed it very heavily in Europe when it was sold as well. Um, and all of that tax money, the specific tax on this dye stuff came to Spain, to the, um, the, the crown. Uh, so it was very profitable. In 1587, 72 tons of cochineal were shipped from Lima, which is in Peru, to Spain. That is 10 billion, 80 million insects to make 72 tons. So just think about how many bugs that is for a second. It's kind of incredible that they were cultivating. And to cultivate this, they had to have fields and fields of the nopal, the prickly pear, and then go out and by hand grab all these little bugs off of it. So it's kind of a crazy amount of work and production. Once in Spain, the shipments were processed in Seville or Cadiz. By 1700, it was traded further abroad to Siam, to Cambodia, to China. Um, the Chinese uh, Kingxi emperor called it Cochni La, and then it was later renamed into uh, and was simply called Yang Hong, which just means foreign red. So in um, China, it's called foreign red. Cochineal is still harvested today, though not quite in the same amount of numbers, but it is used in cosmetics. It's used in cosmetics today. Um, it's also used in the food industry. So it's no longer used to dye um, textile because we have synthetic reds that work better, but cherry coke, red M&Ms, a lot of different kinds of sausages, um, the dye used in red velvet cake and red velvet cupcakes are all dyed with ground up bugs. So now you get to know that. Um, if you look on a label and you see um, E120, that's the the food dye version name of it. So if you see E120 on any of your cosmetics or anything you are eating, that is made out of these little bugs that you see up in the top right. You are welcome. All right, just two more. I'm almost done, I promise. As I said, cochineal is a scale insect. Its European cousin is sometimes referred to as Kerms, K-E-R-M-E-S. 
um, which is actually named after the tree that they are cultivated on. Another specific relative is the Aratat scale, A-R-A-T-A-T, -A which is uh, used to make a color commonly called Armenian red. Um, in Armenia, this color was called Vordan Karmir, um, which literally translates to worm red. So like it's made from, I don't know why it would be called worms. They don't really look like worms to me, but uh, this is one of the ancient natural dye stuffs found in Europe um, and in the Middle East. So it was used pretty widely in Europe and in the Middle East and uh, was traded to India as well. Um, it's used as early as 714 BC when the Neo-Assyrian king um, Sargon the second, third, Sargon, one of the kings, Neo-Assyrian you know, kings, Sargon. Anyway, he seizes um, all this stuff. He goes in um, to what is what was at the time uh, Uratu, which was later Armenia, that area. So he goes into Ur Uratu and kind of defeats them and um, he seizes a bunch of things as kind of the, the pillages, the, the trophies of war. And some of the stuff that he takes is a bunch of textiles. And the reason that these textiles were so appealing is because they had this vibrant red color. And so we know from that um, that it was definitely used that early. Okay. Uh, the Kerm shrub is the best place to cultivate um, these little critters, these little scale bugs. Um, it's sometimes called Kerm's grain because it looked like little red grain all over the, the shrub. Um, they were, however, a little harder to cultivate in large numbers than the cochineal, and it also didn't, it worked pretty well, but didn't work quite as well as cochineal from the Americas. So the cochineal from the Americas kind of overtakes um, this, the market for this particular kind of red, and when the Spanish sort of flood the market with all this cochineal, we don't see as much Armenian red. Okay, this is the last one I'm gonna talk about. Lastly, Tyrian purple. Tyrian purple is made from snails, um, but let's kind of talk about, let's start at a more romantic place. So um, in 48 BC, we have Julius Caesar in Egypt, famous Julius Caesar, Emperor of Rome, that guy. So he's in Egypt and uh, the most famous and the reportedly most beautiful woman in the world wants an audience with him, but he will not uh, agree to see her. She can't get past his guards. So she has herself rolled up in a carpet to be delivered to him as a, get, as a gift. So she's rolled up in this rug and is delivered into his chambers um, as a gift. And he is immediately smitten with her. Nine months later, Cleopatra, who is the most famous beautiful woman, which I am referring to. So Cleopatra uh, gives birth to a son and names him Caesarion, which means little Caesar, not like the pizza, it was a child. Um, the proud father, Julius Caesar, returns to Rome and he is taken to wearing a new style of toga um, that only he, once he gets back to Rome, he decides he is the only one who is allowed to wear it, only the emperor can wear it. But it was dyed to his paramour, his lover's favorite color, which was Tyrian purple. So he starts this new thing of Tyrian purple being associated with royalty and with power in Europe. The super, the rich hue, um, ideally, according to our friend Pliny the Elder, who was one of the people who wrote a lot in the ancient world, so we have a lot of information from him, it's, uh, this color is ideally the color of clotted blood, which is kind of a gross description, but so like a really dark reddish purple, basically. Um, it's the product of two varieties of shellfish that are native to the Mediterranean, and that's um, Hampstoma and Murex, let's see, Thias Hampstoma and Murex branderis. Um, so these are, they look like this, they're shown in this image, so they're these um, sea snails, basically. And if you crack open one of these shells, they're gastropods, if you crack open their shell, you see a gland that is sometimes called the bloom in the dye business. And if you squeeze that gland, you get about a drop or two drops of clear liquid. 
okay. And it smells like garlic for some reason. So then this garlicky clear liquid comes out. When it's exposed to sunlight, it first turns yellow, a pale yellow, and then it turns a dark purpley red color. So that is Tyrian purple. The best color, um, which was so dark that it was tinged with blackness, was created by mixing the gland fluid from both of these varieties of sea snail. So you had to have both of them. To make the color stay, it was a very yucky process. So the liquid from the shellfish was placed in a vat of stale urine, usually human urine, I know it's yucky, uh, for the ammonia, because the ammonia helps it stay. Um, and that's allowed to ferment for 10 days. So stinky garlic, shellfish, fluid, and urine fermenting in a barrel for 10 days. Ugh, yucky. Uh, then the cloth can be added to it and dyed. Um, ancient dye works that produce this color are almost always discovered on the outskirts of town. So when archaeologists discover these things, they're almost always kind of a little ways from the main part of town. The idea, they speculate, but I think it's pretty clear that the, the reason they're on the outskirts of town is because the smell of rotting sea snails and stale urine was probably pretty foul and people didn't want it up in the middle of um, where all the business is done. Um, the name of the dye is due to its association with the Phoenicians. So if you have had art history, you probably know at least a little bit about the Phoenicians. Um, they're in the uh, Aegean Sea. Um, they, one of the places they're from is Tyre, T-Y-R-E, um, and they made a fortune selling this purple dye across the region because it was the best, it was considered the best purple. Um, so Tyrian dyed cloth is mentioned in Homer's Iliad, which as you know was written in 1260 BC. It's also mentioned in Virgil's Aeneid, which was in uh, 29 BC. And depictions have also been found in ancient Egypt. So it's kind of uh, prominent in the cultures of the ancient world. It was a big deal. Um, the color's popularity was bad news for our snail friends, obviously. Each snail contained only about a drop, so it took 250,000 snails to make one ounce of dye, which is sad and kind of crazy. The piles of discarded shells are so large that they became geographic features over the millennia. So they changed the way the coastlines look. They changed the topography of the islands. The snails had to be harvested by hand, so the labor cost <clears throat> alone made the dye very expensive. In the 4th century BC, Tyrian dipped cloth was literally worth its weight in gold. It was the most expensive thing you could buy other than pure gold. This made Tyrian purple a color associated with power, wealth, and royalty. In Rome, it was tightly regulated as a status symbol. So triumphant generals were allowed to wear a purple and gold robe. Senators and other high-ranking officials could wear a band of Tyrian purple in their togas, not the whole toga, just part of it. Um, and then, of course, when Caesar returns to Rome from Egypt, he decreed that only the emperor could wear Tyrian purple and anyone else wearing it could face penalties as harsh as death. So they got pretty crazy about this color. Um, once Emperor Nero, Emperor Nero was crazy, he's the one that we read about fiddling while Rome burned, that guy. Um, so he saw a woman in a play, she's a performer in a recital, wearing a mollusk mauve, so like a, a color that could have been a derivative of Tyrian purple, and he had her grabbed from the stage and dragged off and stripped naked and then seized all of her property. He didn't kill her, but, you know, it's pretty crazy to interrupt a recital and drag a woman off stage and take her clothes and then go to her house and seize all her property. So, big deal, this color. Uh, later, Diocletian, who's a later emperor, um, he's one of the first general emperors, if you study Roman history, anyway, he said that other people could wear Tyrian purple, but they had to pay a really heavy fee. So it's super expensive anyway, and then you have to pay this super high fee, and the fee was paid directly to him. So it didn't even go to like the body of like taxes to fund things in your city, it was just pocket money for Diocletian. Um, okay. The Byzantine queens, so over in the Byzantine em emperor empire over to the east, um, they had special birthing rooms where they gave birth that were draped in Tyrian purple. And the idea was that the royal offspring would then be 
born into the purple, which means born to rule, born into royalty. So they took that symbolism pretty seriously and actually used the dye as kind of a pre-coronation for their offspring upon birth. Um, fortunately for the snails, the fall of Constantinople, which was the head of the Byzantine Empire, uh, it falls in 1453, and that marked the end of the heavy production of Tyrian purple. Four centuries later, a French marine biologist rediscovered it, but that was in 1856, and uh, as I've mentioned him a few times at this point, our friend William Perkin discovers synthetic dyes in that same year, and so our, our little mollusk friends are spared, and they still exist today. So they weren't completely... Um, made extinct by the production of Tyrian purple. Okay, that is a very long history of dyes. Uh, there's a lot more I could say. There's many more dyes that we could talk about, but that's a little bit of a historical context for the value of some of these substances and the kind of wacky history behind them. Okay. <laughs>